in today's video, I want to give you a little brush up of why your photos aren't sharp and how we can solve that in the field. So hello, future me right here. I'm going to share a ton of different techniques to get sharp photos in this video. It's probably best if you just take a piece of paper and write them all down so you remember them. Now back to the video. It is also important to make the distinction between whether something is in focus or whether something is unsharp because it's moving. If something is not in focus, it's simply just because you're not using the right aperture or not focusing in the right place or your depth of field is too narrow or maybe you need to focus stack. That's the basic principles about focusing. But sharpness is also a big thing. So the first thing may be actually that your lens isn't particularly sharp. If you are buying a cheap lens, they are usually not as sharp as the more expensive lenses, the more pro lenses. So right now I'm using the Tamron 28 to 200. It's a great lens, it's a sharp lens, but it's not entirely all the way up there with the top of the line lenses. It's good enough for me, but that could be a thing that you need to take into consideration. So to give you a small example of what it is I mean that you have to look for when looking for image quality of a specific lens. If we go all the way up to the corners of this photo of the 28 to 200 millimeter that I've taken at 35 millimeter, you can see there's a good amount of fringing and it's a little bit as if the details are like smeared out a little bit. However, if we compare to the 16 to 35 millimeter f4 from Sony, the new P set lens, you can see the details are much more clear and there's no fringing whatsoever. So fringing, how the edges are, and especially chromatic aberration, are things you need to look for if you want to get a lens that's a little bit sharper than other lenses. Now, many APS-C cameras, entry-level cameras and so forth, even though they have interchangeable lenses, if they come with a lens when you buy it and it's relatively cheap, chances are it's one of the standard kit lenses. If you know how to use them, you can optimize the sharpness, but generally they're just not as sharp as pro lenses are. Sharpness is, as a rule of thumb, something you pay for. So the next thing that's also playing in, which has a huge effect on the sharpness of your lens, whether it is in the center of the photo or out in the edges of the photo, is what aperture you're photographing at. Obviously, aperture has something to do with the depth of field, it's something to do with when we focus, but it has also something to do with how sharp the lens is. It has something to do with diffraction and how light scatters through the lens. So right now I'm at this scene right here. So I quite like here the background and then I've included some foreground right here, the grass and this tree right there. If you're an experienced photographer, you know that this is a relatively deep depth of field scene, which means I have to close down the aperture. So I'm all the way down at f16. So I'm focusing on the background trees that look really, really nice. So you can see my composition is here. And then I focus on the background trees like this, take the photo. However, when we go into the photo, we can see that the foreground is a little bit blurry. That is simply because it's out of focus, because even f16 is not enough for this. So I will have to also focus on the foreground and take that photo and then combine them in Photoshop. That's called focus stacking. However, I could also close down my aperture to f22. The problem is then that we introduce a lot of diffraction. So even though everything is in focus, diffraction simply just softens up your photo. So usually the rule of thumb is I do not advise people to use the three most closed down apertures in any lens. Most lenses are the most sharp if they have like the most open aperture at f4. They're the most sharp from like f5 to f10, 11-ish, somewhat there. It is hard to distinguish between them and even all the way up at f16, which I'm usually shooting at, sharpness is not a big issue. You can add sharpness afterwards in post-processing. And if you absolutely need to shoot at f22, then you just go ahead and shoot at f22. You can also sharpen that. I have done that before.
Now another issue can be if you are hand holding your camera and there's not enough light and the camera needs a longer shutter speed that you are shaking the camera so the shutter speed is not fast enough. So make sure that shutter speed is generally fast enough. You can put on image stabilization which helps a lot but even then if there's something in your scene that is moving it gets blurred. So if you're indoor photographing your children or whatever they're playing around on the floor and you want to take a snapshot of them and they got all blurry that's because your shutter speed isn't fast enough. So if your shutter speed isn't fast enough you open up the aperture or you increase the ISO and boom fast shutter speed. Now if you're a landscape photographer you're probably out and you have a tripod. A photo can easily get blurry if there's a little bit of wind even though you have your camera on a tripod especially if you treat your tripod like this. You obviously have to make sure that your tripod is set up in the most optimal way. So make sure that the legs of the tripod are spread out properly. So you can see as I put up the tripod like this, spread out properly. Alternatively, you can, if there's a little bit too much wind, you can always collapse the tripod a little bit. And in that way, you should reduce the shakiness of the tripod. Today there's not a whole lot of wind, but if there's a lot of wind, that is one way to go. Another thing is, of course, to get a bigger and more sturdy tripod than the one I have right here. The rule of thumb is, the bigger and heavier the tripod is, the better. So refrain from buying those 20, 30 dollar wobbly tripods. They don't work that well. Another tripod issue can be if you put it all the way up, the center column, generally it is not the worst thing you can do in the entire world, even though it has kind of become a meme by now. I often do it. You just need to take into consideration that your entire setup may be a little bit more wobbly, so you need to compensate for that. Now the thing is, when an entire setup is more wobbly, you can see how I can easily move it all around here. And if I take a photo, then chances are it will get blurry because the shutter speed is like all the way down at one fifth of a second. What you can do is that you can go in and put on two second timer delay or five second timer delay. So in that way, when you press the shutter and you want to take the photo, two second passes by, the camera comes down, there's no more shake, and then the camera takes the photo. What you can also do is to get a remote control or a control that you use with a line. That is the basic only ways to make sure that you are not touching the camera when you're taking a photo. A remote or shutter delay. Now, before we get too far into this video, it's important for me to emphasize that sharpness isn't the end all be all of landscape photography. As long as your photo is in focus and not blurred due to movement, a bit of softness, less megapixels or photos shot with older gear doesn't really matter. Many of my best and most popular photos are not photographed with my new 60 megapixels camera and I keep using my Tamron 28 to 200 because it's just such a convenient lens. Check out my Sony a7R5 camera review if you want my thoughts on that. What really matters for a good photo is what you point your camera towards light and composition. And if you struggle with composition, I have a couple of easy to read ebooks with tons of examples as to get to the point fast. Both ebooks cover nine important compositional tools and ends with a chapter summarizing everything learned in the ebook. There is a link down in the description of the video or via the card in the upper right corner. So the photo I'm attempting right now is actually one of the more demanding when it comes to stability. So I'm photographing all the way out at 400 millimeter with my 100 to 400 millimeter lens. I've taken off image stabilization because I am on a tripod, there's no wind, not an issue. So few to me is just jumping in here. One of the things I forgot to mention in regard to why to take off image stabilization when you're on a tripod is that in many lenses, it is a mechanical thing, the image stabilization. So that means that the lens is moving. If you have image stabilization on while on a tripod, chances are that the image stabilization in itself will compensate for nothing, which means that it will basically start shaking. That is why you, as a rule of thumb, want to take off image stabilization. Now, if image stabilization is built into the camera, my rule of thumb is still to take image stabilization off if you do not need it. Sometimes it works, other times it doesn't. 
But if it is, like today, a completely still day, then image stabilization will likely be more problematic than actually solve a solution which isn't there. But remember, taking off image stabilization is only useful if your camera is stable, if it's on a tripod. If you handhold your camera, definitely put on image stabilization. I've taken off image stabilization because I am on a tripod, there's no wind, not an issue. As you can see, I've had to extend it because where I'm photographing, there's this little bush right there. Actually, this scene here, I've been here before, and that tree was one I photographed like almost one and a half year ago. It's by now, it's crazy how time flies. You can see it here. Anyway, I'm photographing these trees just next to it. The composition, fairly simple, zoomed all the way in. I'm just taking almost like a portrait of the tree right here. But what I'm doing is, I have actually had to put it all the way up to a shutter delay of five seconds, because with this big heavy lens on, it takes a little bit more time for the tripod to fall into being completely silent whenever I touch the camera. So five seconds is necessary. And another thing is to put the camera, depending on how you set up your menu, but put it into silent mode. In that way, you're using the electronical shutter and not the mechanical shutter. There we go. And that ought to do it. Perfectly sharp photo from edge to edge. Now, especially with long lenses like this one, and when you extend them, it's really, really good to have a lens collar with a lens foot on it that you can attach to the tripod. It simply puts the center of gravity of your entire setup into the middle of the tripod, which also makes it much more stable. And if you need to take vertical photos, you just unlock your lens collar like this here and do like this. Perfect. And in that way, you can also get a vertical shot with best stability. So I want to circle back to the thing about problem solving. So one of the things to also make sure is that your entire camera setup, including the tripod, the camera and so forth, that all the knobs are properly tightened. If a knob like this here isn't properly tightened, then chances are that actually the tripod starts to slide a little bit and that can of course create blur when you expose. There's also a problem up here so maybe if the center column part here isn't tightened properly it can be that the entire ball head isn't properly screwed on to the tripod. Maybe your panning knob isn't properly tightened. Maybe your main knob on the ball head isn't properly tightened. Maybe the camera isn't tightened properly to the ball head. So there's all sorts of different knobs that you need to identify to see and check up on whether they are properly tightened. Another thing is also to see what type of blur do we have. So if your photo is blurred in a way that everything is kind of like stretched, so that could probably be because your entire setup is very front heavy. So if you have attached your camera to your tripod <laughs> like this, that means that when you expose, chances are that the lens out here is actually moving the entire setup a little bit down, which will result in blur that kind of like stretches everything in the vertical plane. So when it comes to getting sharp photos, it's all about identifying all those small issues that a camera can have that you need to fix. Definitely try to identify the issue. That is what it's all about. So right now I'm photographing a scene that I also photographed like there one and a half year ago. It's not as interesting today as it was back then because I had it like backlit and morning mist and yeah, very, very beautiful scene. But I still quite like it. There's some symmetry about it. The composition is very strong. And I have this little bird out there that is like swimming around and doing whatever birds are doing. <laughs> so what I did was that I have taken one shot at f16 
ISO 50 and focused on the background, which gave me a shutter speed of about half a second, one second ish. And then I've also taken one photo at a more open aperture, ISO 640 ish, with the little bird right there in front. But that also means that the background is out of focus. So then I'll just going to blend those two photos in Photoshop to get everything as sharp as possible. That is also called focus tagging. If you want to learn how I blend photos, how I edit all my photos, editing techniques and so forth, be sure to enroll in my huge Photoshop for landscape photographers post-processing course. There is a link down in the description of the video with a coupon code where you can save $45. And there is a 30 days money back guarantee if you do not enjoy the course or think you learn anything from it. So link is in the description if you want to learn all my editing techniques. Ooh, I like this photo right here. So I've come in to the forest. This is a classic beech tree forest in Denmark. So you see here plenty of very tall and straight up beech trees like this and a fairly open forest floor. So it actually gives a lot of opportunities for photographs. So I'm photographing here in this direction over here. There we go. This scene right there zoomed in to about 150 millimeter and there's so much depth and interest to look at in this photo and especially the color contrast between the bluish fog and then the reddish forest floor with all the beech tree leaves <laughs> so it's very simple I am not trying to battle with the foreground being out of focus. I'm just letting it be out of focus and then I simply just like focus on the background. But one thing I got to think about is that in lenses like this here, one thing you need to be aware of in regard to sharpness is that different focal lengths within the lens may differ a little bit in sharpness. And depending on the aperture you use, you may actually have a very sharp photo right in the center of the frame at f11 however the edges of the frame may not be as sharp whereas if you actually close down to f16 you may lose a little bit of sharpness in the center however you get more sharp edges that's also a thing to keep in mind and it's simply just something that differs from lens to lens and it may even differ between the same model of lenses it's simply just how the light goes through the particular lens. It's something to be aware of, but it's usually not a big deal for most photographs. You can't see it, but it is a thing to be aware of. So I also promised to show you how I focus with my camera as a landscape photographer. This is my preferred way of focusing basically any scene, almost any scene. So if I have a scene like this right here, I make sure that my focus area is on spot focus. I have it on L, which is large. I can also have it on medium or small, but I just have it on large. Then I have this little square thingy that I can move around with my joystick. So let's say I want to focus on this tree right here. I'm using back bottom focusing, so my focus bottom is here. Then I simply just focus on that. Now, if I'm in doubt whether I'm in focus or not, I simply just enlarge my screen. So I put it up here. So you can see it's very big. Now I'm zoomed all the way in to this tree and then I focus right there on that tree. And now I'm sure I have perfect focus on that. And I simply just take the photo. If I want to focus stack, I take one photo here. You can see if I enlarge the screen, the background is actually a little bit blurry. Then I take one photo for the foreground tree and a photo for the background trees depending on how many photos I need to take because some of the scene is still out of focus. In this particular scene, I just move around and see whether something more besides the foreground tree is out of focus and it doesn't really seem like it. And then even though, even though I have my little square up here, I have made sure that I have focused on the background. As you can see here, focus. Then I can simply just take that photo too and there we go, I have two photos that I can combine in Photoshop with some focus tagging. Easy peasy. For the most part, I try to avoid focus tagging 
because it is a little bit of a pain <laughs> in the ass. I hope you learned a thing or two from this video to get sharp photos. If you want to learn more about composition or how I edit my photos, be sure to check out the links in the description of the video. See you next time.